Dana Denha here, and this is Let's Watch with the Ann Arbor Film Festival. Ann Arbor's annual film festival celebrates arts and artists of mediums of all kinds. Obviously, films are a highlight of the six-day arts extravaganza, but organizers also strive to make it an interactive experience. Joining me is Troy Ramos, interdisciplinary artist based out of Metro Detroit, taking part in the Ann Arbor Film Festival's 2023 Off the Screens program. Welcome to the show, Troy. Thank you. Thanks for having me. You know, one of the first things I always like to talk to people about is, you know, your background, your schooling, what sort of led you to the arts? Boy, um, this feels like a long road with many turns. Uh, I actually started out as a composer um, and yeah, I sort of switched once I realized that composing was an even tougher road than being an artist. <laughs> Like to get like new new things to surface in the classical music world is very difficult, and I it, I didn't really feel like I fit in after at a certain point just a light bulb went off and I thought wait a minute I think the art world is actually where I was supposed to be, so I started doing sound installations, um, and it's funny how when those things happen I started to think I started to remember that when I was younger, I always had a video camera around and up like a camcorder or whatever. So I started to think, well, okay, so sound, yes, but also sound and video. And then it just sort of went from there. It became all these different mediums that I spend a lot of time working with or trying to create things with. It's interesting how that happens too, because I feel like when you, I mean, college was a long time ago for me um but when you first start college you like feel like you have to like pick this path like you're like I need to know what I need to do because I ended up getting two degrees because I had gone so far with one and then I was like I don't know if this is really what I want to do and so it is like this it's a strange feeling when you graduate from high school and you have to move on to the next chapter of your life and actually figuring out who you are and what you want to be as a person yeah, I that's a lot of pressure for anyone, especially a 20 year old, give or take. Like, that's I it, it seems like there should be uh different uh career type forks in the road every 10 years because the more you get experience in life, it's things change or you realize things later that you didn't realize before. So, I, I don't know how anybody uh, could do it that early hats off to people who can but you know like you it, i think maybe the, also one of the consequences of a system like that is that it can really cause a lot of self-doubt you think oh i don't have anything figured out or i i don't know what i'm doing and maybe you do but you're so focused on what you're not in the in the sort of the general masses and what they do and so it makes you think twice about what you're doing and then you sort of have to at least for me anyway I had to like sort of get grounded and confident and go oh no, no this is what I'm gonna do I don't care if I fail it doesn't matter I have to do this yeah and I feel like you push yourself harder once you finally realize that that thing that it is for you whatever it might be that's when you start like you're like I care more about this than I did the other thing that I was doing and it's <laughs> obvious right right yeah and you like have to you start to prioritize differently as you get older and so the it things it becomes also like how feasible is this and like can i make a living off of this and that's a tough game too but especially when you're younger like i don't know how you would know what you were supposed to do like what i don't know what i want to eat tomorrow like for lunch like so <laughs> how would i know like a major life choice like 20 years from now like i don't know maybe 20 years from now i want to be a poet or i want to be you know, a gamer, I, I don't know, like, it, and it seems that seems like a logical thing to feel. Yeah, I like how you say, like, be open to like, whatever the future brings, because I think nowadays, we see a lot of people have different career paths and stuff. And your art is you have a lot of different sorts of mediums that you're working with. Um, you're a painter, you do stuff with neon lights, you make films. Talk about some of your different art and how that sort of makes you whole as well. I think I think that does play into it, like how I feel in a particular uh, period of of life, like a couple month period or something. And I'll I'll 
without sort of disrespecting the craft of whatever it is I'm doing or the technique, like I, I've been doing some of them for a long time and some of them for not very long, but I, I, I've always liked the idea that the medium should serve the idea, not the other way around. So if I have an idea for found object sculptures, I want to be able to do it, even if it's not something that, say, I hadn't done before. And I think the, the for me, it's it's kind of interesting, at least to watch other people do stuff like that because you start to see connective threads like even if it's painting or if it's film if they do both you can still kind of see stylistic qualities you know that both have like david lynch uh painter filmmaker went to art school first but you can you can still kind of see like why his movies are like that when you look at his paintings like they're very kind of creepy but interesting and cool and you know it's 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 not it's it sort of goes in phases for me so like you know i i might do something for heavily for a few years and then kind of sort of balances out with something else for a few years while maintaining the skills for the other thing but and it also depends on the projects that i've got going too so you know you talk about not knowing maybe even how to do something so how do you hone hone in on those skills to be better at whatever medium you're trying to conquer. Yeah, that's a tough one. I I would say it I feel like at this point I've hopefully got it narrowed down to a couple so I don't have to take on too much um or if it's something that I'm not that familiar with I will stick with what I know and then ask someone else to come in. So for example like the neon light installations i do i don't know how to make neon or blow glass and i don't have 20 years to learn how to do that so i will i will design those and then i i there's a friend i have in detroit who makes neon he's really good at it and so i'll just go to him and be like is this possible can i do this or and then can you install this it's on brick it's outside what you know so like if it's something that it's challenging like that i'll just ask for help which isn't always easy for me for some reason i don't know why but i like but to it's do like a collaboration in a way you know you're working with and the interesting thing about the neon thing when you sent me your images i was like neon is such like a hot thing now when you like look at like celebrities houses and stuff like that like i you know like really? cribs or whatever show you're watching you might be watching but they always have like these neon signs with sayings on them so it sort of reminded me of like this hip new culture that people are putting in their house like in talk about your ideas with the neon because you'll have like sayings but it'll also just be like abstract which i think you're really into designs yeah i didn't know that about celebrities in their houses but that's pretty interesting i mean i knew that it was something that was we were talking about vinyl before and pinball machines and that neon's kind of the same thing like it it went away for a while and now it's sort of coming back but I I spent I, I'm originally from Michigan, but I spent a lot of time in Oregon, in Portland. And Portland was very good at keeping a lot of the vinyl or the neon signs, like a lot of the movie theaters or like even just like the sort of the public places. Neon was they just kept it. Like the, we think that, I guess they thought this is going to come back. It's going to be cool, whatever. And it just has such a beautiful look to it that. It's of course it was never going to go away, in my opinion. Um, now it's it's hard to find people who can do that if you want, if you have ideas for it. But so if you know someone, if you're lucky enough to know someone um, and you have ideas, then that's that's a good start. And so for me, I I, I want to be able to do stuff that I, I want the idea to be able to live its fullest potential. Um, so it helps to have people who can do that, but if, whether it's an abstract design or if it's a saying or a quote or something, I guess it just kind of depends on the, the thoughts and ideas that I have, like the, one of them I found in a, um, a, a word art piece, one of the neon ones I found uh, in an inscription in a book in an old a bookstore in Portland. So that one just kind of happened. And I thought I have to. I have to do something with this. And then other things will just be 
abstract ideas or designs that I sort of draw out or write down and think, I think I should put this in neon. And when you're uh, talking about your paintings and stuff, they seem pretty abstract too. So talk about the ideas behind your painting and sort of maybe your influences and what makes you want to be an abstract painter or just sort of takes you there. I've always loved abstraction and the idea that um, whether it's sound or video or paintings or that, that the potential of, of creating something that's never been seen before exists, you know, like it, it kind of sits at the edge of what is known and what has never been known. And I, and I like representational things that, you know, they're, there's a place for that too. I mean, there's, there's a lot of great painters who do um, representational things, but for me, there's something about the idea that there's uh, um, an artwork, which allows people to sort of create these worlds and, and, and interpret it as however they would like in all these wild ways. I, 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 whenever I have something, I always enjoy other people's interpretations more than my own. Like, I don't even want to tell people what they are, you know? Yeah. I'd rather people just, I, I love overhearing people, especially if they don't know I'm in the room or from the gallery or something like it's a dangerous game to play, but like, I like what yeah. rather when it comes off. Well, I love hearing what other people have to say because it's so fascinating and that's that's one of the big things is that it just allows people to sort of contribute their own idea about what it is. So what we're doing anyway, I think, is just taking it and putting it to use in our own life. Yeah. And I think as an artist, you really have to put yourself out there and be open to what people have to say about what you're making and what you're creating. Yeah, for sure. I mean, I, I at this point, I have a pretty thick skin. I've had some terrible things said to me, but that's OK. It's part of the game. You know, it's like uh and you know i've i've said terrible things about other people's works too or films or albums i've listened to and i think nah and then five years later i think actually that's really good i was wrong you know and it takes a while to sort of get connected with it in some way so yeah, yeah it's, it's definitely a taste thing too like you can look back to like when you were a kid and you're like oh i watched this movie like a hundred times i loved it so much and then you watch it as like an adult and you're like i don't know why i watch that movie so much <laughs> right yeah oh, that films are weird in that way like they they have that ability to change over time i suppose that everything probably does but film is particularly weird because there's so many people involved in it and our culture changes too. So like things that weren't taboo at the time then become something that you would never even see in a movie being made now. Right. Yeah. That's a, that's a strange one because you, even if you go back and watch something that doesn't seem taboo, but everyone else seems it, that it is, it's like, Oh God, what I, can I not tell anybody that I like this movie still? Or <laughs> yeah. you know, I don't, maybe it'll switch. Maybe that's a more of a cultural thing, I guess, like a, like maybe we'll move into different spots in the future with that, but it is, you're right. It is us changing around the artwork. I used to, I used to work at the Portland art museum and I used to look at paintings every day for years. And the way I felt about some of them at the beginning was not the way I felt. Say I didn't, I felt differently at the end. Mm -hmm. And I used to think like, wow, there's so, it's so interesting because they're, they're changing in front of me. And it's like, I think I'm changing, but I'm not really sure who's alive and who's, who's sort of, um, uh, what's the word when you, like you make it over time, like it's timeless. It becomes, it starts to change or it stays timeless, but you didn't see it, but now you do. Mm -hmm. So it's a really interesting thing about what's changing. Is it us or is it all of us or is it, you know? the space that it's in, if it moves. And and if you see a movie at home versus a movie theater, like that can have a huge impact on whether you like something or not, not just the time or anything like that. So it's, it's fascinating, I think. Well, on that note, why don't we take a look at a portion of Passing Time, Troy's video and art installation from 2019.
We're here with Troy. What was your inspiration for Passing Time and how was it originally viewed in 2019? Uh, you know, I don't remember how, you mean like how other people viewed it? Yeah, like was it at a gallery? Was it an art installation at like a film festival sort of? Yeah, uh, the first, it premiered at a at a, an exhibition, a group exhibition. Um, and then like maybe just before the pandemic and then during the pandemic art mile detroit it's like a world it's like a citywide like festival of, of mostly digital things i think and a curator who was worked at the detroit institute of art as a curator just found it online and put it in the festival and so that had a much bigger reach i think than the original audience so those are the two those two and then youtube uh, would be the be the three platforms i suppose it's it's hard to say like at the time i create something it's hard to know exactly what i'm i was thinking at the time because i almost feel like a different person but it was sort of i i, I think i was a little bit uh um annoyed with society in a way at the time i made that because i felt like like i wasn't being seen a little bit and so i had an idea to sort of make a video in three parts where the first part I'm just, I think I'm just sitting there. And then the second part I'm counting numbers. And then the third part I'm sort of yelling at myself. And, but I didn't want to like broadcast the yelling. I wanted to broadcast what I thought were inner thoughts. And so since I'm always thinking about creating sounds and visuals, I put a uh, piano music that I had written uh, maybe two years earlier to it because I thought that I thought I liked the idea of sort of the harmony of what you're seeing visually with what might be going on inside my head was actually going inside my head, not what I'm saying, you know, like the things that, the difference between the two. Yeah. What about putting yourself into your artwork? Does that feel uncomfortable or was it something that felt normal to you because you, it was your thoughts? Mm. I, do, I do like the idea of having other people step in front of the camera but for practical purposes it 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 seems like it just works more quickly if i use myself i don't necessarily like to do it um i don't dislike it but it's 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 uh it's just easier for me to get stuff done if i just step in front of the camera as you know i if if i if i'm creating something where there has to be acting involved then i i I shouldn't use myself. I have to, I should find somebody <laughs> else. But if it's, you know, if it's this type of an installation, the I think the idea, maybe the idea sort of subconsciously, I understand that. So then the the work becomes something where I don't have to showcase any acting skills. It just becomes more of like an art, whatever the difference is, whatever a more of an art type film. Mm -hmm. So yeah, I feel you on that, though, too. I mean, I, I make a lot of videos for CTN and uh, I'll just use myself and my daughter as like the talent because we're here and it's like a lot right. easier to just use us yeah. than to try to find solicit someone else to come and be in front of the camera. And obviously, a lot of times, unless you know someone that's an actor, people don't really feel comfortable being in front of the camera for especially when it's not just like an interview like this, but like you're pretending to do something else yeah i i i yeah i i think it's interesting because you're right i think that people don't want to get in front of the camera generally speaking and yet instagram you know like oh yeah it's so straight like i think those are mostly photos which they can kind of video is different because you've got to be able to string it together a few sentences or so it's a weird sentence to say mm -hmm. that but yeah, it's, it's, um, I have ideas for other people, but they just, it just seems like such an energy suck to like schedule things and be like, can you do, how about Wednesday? Could you do, I mean, you're probably doing that a lot and it's not always easy. It's just easier to just turn the camera around and go, let's just do this. Yeah, I, I completely agree with you. Can you talk about that idea of like being two faced in the video? Yeah. Um, 
so I wanted I wanted to do something where I was talking to myself. I was in a place at that time, physical place where I was um I was in like a small town briefly for the summer on the west side of the state and I didn't really know anyone so I thought this is not only like that I don't that I don't want to ask anyone else to be a part of this video it's also that I'm kind of just alone right now like I'm just these few months are just which is good can be a good thing like you can get a lot done but there's bad things that come with being alone too so I think I think it was kind of the idea was that I am having conversations with myself more than I would like and mm -hmm. so that sort of I think was representative of that particular time in my life where I was you know in this small town just beautiful small town not far from a lake but you know there's not a lot going on great people around but I didn't know any of them so it was like it became this sort of uh, comment on maybe on loneliness and like thoughts and the difference between what you see in real life and what's actually going through someone's life. Like you're passing through someone like you go on the road and you're on the highway and you're next to someone at the stoplight. What's their story? You know, are they just going to the store? Are things actually okay? Are things maybe things are okay? But you, but we see everyone every day, and we don't really delve into what's actually happening to them. Well, let's watch Troy's work moving in shorter thoughts. We're back with Troy Ramos. Why don't you tell us about the process of creating this work and how it's similar to what audiences can experience at the 2023 Ann Arbor Film Festival? Well, the idea was, as usual, is to sort of um, explore minimalism, just to keep things simple and to have uh, an experience w where you think something is not happening, but there actually is something happening, like subtlety and and is there power in subtlety? Is there is there um, something interesting about minimalism? To me, there is, and maybe you know to other people, uh, there we're, we get sort of used to having all these flashing lights around us and like phones and technology. But I really, I don't know if I do this on purpose necessarily but i really almost like to put something up where people are I don't know, challenged by it but but in the sense of like this is too boring i gotta walk away from this i don't to me it's i i love it not because i created it but because it sort of explores the idea of like just sitting and thinking is that's an activity and i do it a lot and this light bulb swinging, sometimes it doesn't swing and sometimes it does. And there are nine videos for this. Each one has its own sound work and video work. So the light bulb is moving at different times and they're each of their own duration and they each have their own sound work. So eventually they get off, so to speak, and you have different possibilities of harmonies and visuals. So it's never gonna be the same. So the idea that there's nothing happening 
I think is not true because <laughs> there's so many things happening, but it's just subtle. Do you think it's a different thought process when you're doing an art installation? Because I don't think that's typical for a lot of artists where they're doing installations. That's like a unique thing that only certain artists do. So the thought process behind it and sort of using all of your techniques. I mean, you're using the sound you create, lighting, abstraction, sculpture. Those are my, those don't happen enough where I get to incorporate several different things, but I do like it when that happens where I have sound and video and, and sort of a conceptual art or the thinking about conceptual works is very important to me. Like I love sitting around and just thinking about ideas and it's a huge part of the process for me. And I love it when I have a project or an idea where those things can kind of like just come together and, and be together and harmonize you know um and yeah it's it's uh in i think in this work you're right i think that there's a lot of things coming together i don't know it depends i i guess there are lots of um it depends on the space as well you know like if they're it'll be interesting to see what happens with the ann arbor film festival with this installation because it's it is a film technically but it's it's a different kind of thing. And so to, it'll be interesting to see how it interacts with the festival itself and the people who attend. What, uh, do you know where it's going to be on display at the festival this year? I th- I'm not entirely sure. I think it's going to be at the Ann Arbor art center. I think they wanted to put it in the window and have the sounds be broadcast on the street, which will be really interesting. Cause well, and uh, that's like a heavy traffic area. That's like a busy area in downtown Ann Arbor. So that's pretty cool. We're almost out of yeah. time, Troy. So before we go, I always like to ask people why they should support the Ann Arbor film festival as an artist, as a viewer, as someone that just wants to know more. I think, well, there's probably a lot of reasons that one of them at least is that, if you don't support things, they go away. So you have to support them and you have to, to participate in, and it's not like, you know, on top of that, you're getting something great in return. So if you go down and you watch a movie or you support it, you're, you're, you're not just supporting something that will be able to sustain itself and grow, but you're also getting some, if you have to look at it selfishly, you could think I'm getting something great that I can apply to my own life because you're going to see really good films and you're going to be supporting I assume local filmmakers. I haven't seen, you know, what the lineup is, but, and, and those, those people are artists, obviously they need support. And, and so you're supporting so many things just by going down there. Then uh, it comes back around, I think makes, makes the culture stronger, makes, makes the economy stronger. There's a number of reasons. Well, I want to thank you so much for being a guest on the show. Thank you for having me. To watch this and other CTN series, visit youtube.com slash CTN Ann Arbor. And remember to like, subscribe, and share. I'm Dana Denhofer. Let's watch with the Ann Arbor Film Festival.